You're at 109 right now. No, he a genius. He just can't claim it. Cause they like. Yeah. You're at 109 right now. Hi. How are you? It's been a minute. Um, but now we're together again. So I can't, uh, I can't say that that's, uh, I can't complain, right? There's no reason to complain. We're, we're, we're back together again. So you're looking good. Things have been going well for you. I see taking care of business. <laughs> ah, check you out doing your thing. Me? Well, I've been, uh, I've been busy. You dig? I've been busy with work. Um, I had to take a few days off, not because I'm sick, not be figuratively. I am kind of sick, you know, uh, the, what is it? The, uh, the holiday is upon us. And I, I guess I was just too anxious, um, because I took the days off and I'm like, I, I was, I was laying in bed and I was just like, I just want to stay here. And, and I was kind of thinking about it, saying to myself, this is terrible behavior, terrible, absolutely terrible behavior. When in life does a grown ass man say, no, I'm just going to stay in the bed today. Like, no, that ain't it. That's not it. I'm, I'm just going to stay in the bed today. I'm not going to go to work. No, thank you. Not today. You know, like in what, in what world does that happen? Um, in my defense, I kind of don't live in the world of, you know, of work. I mean, let's, if we try to dissect what I'm saying here, let's see, you know, own the fact that you know, you are the master of your destiny on that. Okay. And so, you know, it's better to work. It's better to move in the direction of work because you're, you're earning your living and you have to do that. Uh, I have to do that. And um, there's no way of getting around that. So if you're not going to work, you're at a detriment. You're not you're not maximizing the utility of your time. Boom. Where is that language from? That's from my finance education. Um, that has to do with uh, economics. That has to do with a little bit of finance. Uh, maximizing the utility of something. In this case, your time. So if everyone has, you know, at, a min at minimum a 40-hour work week, it behooves everyone to show up for their jobs and go to work to collect their paycheck because the companies that they, that you work for, well, they're expecting you to be there for 40 hours to pay you that. So at, at least the minimum you can do is that 40 hour uh, work week and, and give them that. And you have no complaints. You cannot, you can't renege on that. However, in my case, I mean, my condition, the fact that I'm uh, just, just a little tired and very anxious for the uh, vacation to begin, um, that is no excuse for me not to show up. Uh, however, the other thing about this is also the, what the hell was it? It was... um. At some point, I want to say, you know, it's because I'm a substitute. I'm a substitute teacher. That's what I want to bring up. I forgot my train of thought, but okay. I got this other train coming, so we'll, we'll hop on that train. It's kind of going in the same direction. Maybe it will connect, and we'll get to where we want to go. Um, but when I started being a substitute teacher, and congratulations to me. Let me, let me turn on the applause, man. Congratulations to me. I made it. I made it through one whole year of being a substitute teacher. I survived. And a lot of people would not have done, would not have made it. 
So, I mean, this is a huge congratulations, a huge applause, pat on the back, because, you know, folks are like, sadly, the school where I work doesn't have the best reputation. You know, it can be, it is a, you know, it can be very rough around the edges. It could be a quite crude environment to work in. But I was built for this, you dig? Like, I come from this. I come from that. In in some, I've had experiences that have already prepared me for this experience. So I'm not, I'm not phased by it at all. That's why I made it for a year. And uh, inshallah, God willing, I'll make it through another whole bunch of many more years and be like uh, another one of the teachers there who celebrated 30 years plus, you know, working there. I'm just trying to protect my privacy and not mention the names, but I mean, you can, you, you can find that information out. I'm just not going to, um, willfully, you know, just tell you right now. So please respect my privacy, you know, but, um, anyway, yeah, when I started working a year ago as a, as a sub, then we had the ability to to decide like when we were going to work we were able to say hey um sign me up for monday uh, i don't want to work on tuesday or wednesday i'll accept a job on thursday and i'll decide whether i want to work on friday like you could do that you could pick and choose your days although honestly when once you become a sub they start calling you they blow up your phone until it, it's like uh it's like you're uh voluntarily um you're you're voluntarily ex um allowing yourself to be bullied by this job the job says they call you and they say we got a job for you we got a job for you come on answer your phone we got a job for you if you don't answer your phone they're just gonna call you back there's like a a window over which they they just keep calling you we got a job for you. you. Got a job for you. Accept the job. Come on, you got to do the work. <laughs> oh, it's annoying. And so, at one point, um, I was annoyed by this, and I was willing to accept the residency, a position, which meant instead of going to any school and accepting jobs on a daily basis, you accept one school. And you're married to that school. And so you have to go to that school daily. And whatever substitute work they have for you, you just pick it up and do it. You know, kind of like a rag doll. Here, do this. Go over here. Go there. Go here. Go there. Go here. Go there. Everything changes at a moment's notice. You could get assigned to one class and stay there for, uh, you know, a while. So you could have some stability or... Yeah, you could just be go. You could just go from classroom to classroom on a daily basis, classroom to classroom, da 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 da, da which is what I've been doing, going from classroom to classroom. Except when a certain teacher was in an, um, a serious car accident and uh, did not show up for over a month, and I had that teacher's class for that month. You know, um, that teacher has healed uh, from said. Uh, car accident and injuries. Thank God. That teacher is a lovely, um, lovely, valuable uh, teacher, asset, and colleague. So shout out to that teacher. Um, I'm glad you're doing much better. And, you know, again, inshallah, God willing, you know, um, you know, nothing like that will happen to any of us, to, you know, any of my colleagues. It's a, it's a dangerous world we live in. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so I, I made it. I made it through a year of being a substitute teacher. But we're going into this vacation period, and I'm just like, ugh, I'm over it. I'm like, leave me alone. Start this holiday already. I think one of the reasons why I feel this way is because I know that I'm not prepared for the holiday. I don't have any um, 
any plans. I don't have any trips um, that I can take. I don't have any flights that I've paid for that I can, you know, board and fly away to other locations and have something to look forward to. I just have, you know, freedom, free time uh, over the course of three long weeks. And, um, and that's nerve wracking. That's that make that, I guess that's made me anxious and depressed because I look forward to travel. I look forward to having those adventures, seeing uh, new countries, uh, practicing my language skills, you know, challenging myself in that way, but, you know, staying at home and having all of the, the comforts of home during like for instance during the right after thanksgiving they had the black friday sales or whatever i bought a television i bought a television and um i haven't owned a television uh, of my own since 2016 okay uh in 2016 maybe 2014 no, 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 excuse me. Okay, since 2016, I have not owned my own television. 2016 was the last time. So I think I may have bought a television between 2014 and 2016. Um, and so over those two years, I had this, like, I think an LG monitor. Pretty big, 20-some inch, whatever, uh, monitor. Um, there, I didn't watch television. I watched YouTube uh, videos. I had this monitor, this television monitor, TV monitor connected to my iPad, my iPad mini at the time. And, and that was it. And so, uh, yeah, that was the last time I had a television to myself. And then before that, uh, I did not own a particular, I did not own the television Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 2014. No, I might have had that television. I might have had the same television I had until 2016. I might have had it in 2013 or 2012. I'm not certain. I'm really not certain. I'm thinking. I'm. I, I'm. I'm in my mind right now. I'm looking back on on my uh, years in Korea, and I know I had a television when I was working at the university in Korea, and that television. Um. Yeah, I had it. I guess I'm so far removed from that experience. I guess I can give the names. Um, when I lived at the Tehuang Dream Heights and I worked at, uh, at Yongnam De Hakyo in the city of Gyeongsan or Gyeongsan Shi, um, then now I worked there from 2010 to 2014. And at some point I had my own monitor. And I think I took that monitor from the apartment that they gave me. And then I downsized and moved into another apartment. So I think I had it when I when I when I lived in that first apartment because I had it in the second apartment. And then I transferred. I moved all the way to another city later when I left that job. And I worked in the city of Iksan or Iksan Shi, where I worked at the uh Wong Guang De Hakyo, Wong Guang University. And I had that television there. So I had it in two places at two universities and so for the first university i worked there from 2010 to 2014 and at some point between those in those four years i bought it i bought the the tv monitor at some point at that time and then i i when i left that job and i moved to the other city i took it with me so i know i had it from 2000 and 2014, 2015, and 2016. I know I had it then. I might have had it from in 2013, 2012, 2011. I don't know. I really don't know. Wait a minute. No. There are some other memories that remind me. Like I remember having, I was on a date 
and I brought my date back to my um, my apartment, and we were watching that television. We were watching a movie on that television in my apartment, and that must have been 2011 or 2012. So I might have had that same TV for four years. Wow. And then when I finally, in 2016, when I left Korea for good, I left that television behind, as well as many other belongings. I remember these details. I do. If I were to sit down and talk to a writer similar to, uh, what's his name? Alex Haley, the way that Malcolm X did, I could come away with, a, with an autobiography with a, a lengthy autobiography of stories and things just to tell, you know? I could do it. And um, <clears throat> these, these, uh, these memories are very vivid, very clear. That's an interesting part about life these days. When you're a photographer, when you have, uh, you know, when you have experiences and you record them on video or in photographs, those memories are much clearer. You can recall those events, you know, maybe because you're not storing so much information. You're not trying to recall every detail. Those pictures and images, you know, pop up and, and, and they help you. So you don't need to uh, re remember so many things. I'm just speaking extemporaneously, but I, I think you you know that already if you're joining me here at the IC109 podcast. I'm your host, Larry Wiggs. You're at 109 right now. I want to get into my favorite topic about 109 um, because I was just watching a video that I had made about my subject of 109, and as I was listening to myself, you know, as I was listening to my voice and listening to my recount of events, I realized like, hey, I did a pretty good job of retelling these stories. And I was speaking extemporaneously, impromptu. I didn't have a script in front of me. And I was just, I was just riffing, just telling it like it is. And, um, I was kind of in, in, in interested in what I was saying. At some point, I did lose interest. I was like, uh, he, he just keeps talking. <laughs> so I'm speaking about myself, right? <laughs> but I was able to hold my attention for a while, and I thought that was cool. I listened to about 15 minutes of the 33 minutes uh, of audio. And... Um, I think maybe about eight minutes. I was, uh, I was, I was locked and loaded, locked in, and then I was distracted by various um, chess games and what have you, and so that's what happened. But um, it was good, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't bizarre, it wasn't crazy, it wasn't weird. It was like, wow, the dude's just telling his story, and then, and there you have it. So, yeah, it gave me confidence. I'm like, wow, I didn't do so so poorly. I don't sound so crazy talking about this stuff. It's like chill. It's like I'm just telling my 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 experience, and I'm not trying to lead you to any conclusions. I'm just saying I'm just telling it like it is, and I don't think anybody can 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 fault me or front on me and say, oh, that's whack. It's like, wow. That's actually pretty interesting, dude. So, yeah. So that's that. All right. The last episode of the IC109 podcast, I gave a recap of, 23rd, of 2023. But 2023 is not over. And some interesting things just happened last, last night. That's what I want to um, tell you about here at the IC109 podcast. You're at 109 right now. Nip, tell them what it is. No, your genius, he just can't claim it. Yeah. That's what it is. You dig? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, uh, by the way, today I went to the museum and I was listening to people talk about their lives and their experiences 
as part of an exhibit, as part of a video um, exhibit. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, the experience was just so similar. I wrote some notes about that. I wrote some notes about that and I could actually read those notes now, but that will take away from, you know, the momentum that I have going into this other topic. So um, hopefully I will remember to come back to that topic. I hope that I will remember so I could just go ahead and, um, you know, and keep the uh, keep the momentum going. All right, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> last night I had the opportunity of uh, having my my book signed by the sisters of my favorite artist Jean Michel Basquiat, and in in that moment, I was able to talk directly to the sisters. Um, before or while they were uh, signing my uh, book, <clears throat> uh, they they signed it. You know, it's a generic sign, a, a generic signature. Thank you for your support, or what have you. I think you know they might have. They they probably wrote that to everyone. Um, they definitely wrote it. Wrote my name. Hey, I'm I'm kind of wait a minute, Larry. Larry and they, and I asked them to write 109, Larry 109. I wonder if Janine heard my name as Harry because it really looks like she wrote Harry. Oh lord. I should have told her my name was Alfredo. So there will be no confusion about what my actual name is. So I think Janine wrote Harry and I think Lisan wrote Larry. Lisan was like, no, he said Larry. Janine wrote Harry. <laughs> I love those two, man. Dude, Lisan and Janine are awesome. And just, man, I've been watching so many videos um of them. And I'm like, I'm I'm like, cool. They're very cool. But then to talk with them, or rather to have their undivided attention, man, it was like, oh, that's cool. Yo, so I had a I had a moment with them. I mean, like you know what? It was such a cool um, interaction. It was it was really dope. Like they they laughed, they chuckled because I told them that my book had already been signed by Jean Michel Basquiat's niece, Sophia. And so um, when I showed them, I pointed it out. I was like, um, "Hey, I already got Sophia's um, signature." you know, in my book. And they were like, what? So they looked and they heard, they were like, look, Sophia, they just, you know, kind of geeked out like, oh, Sophia signed his book. Oh, that's so cute. I was like, yeah. Like the thing about, you know, me seeing, meeting Sophia, I was, I was about to enter the, um, the, the exhibit and I saw Sophia and I noticed given her features, and you know the way that she looked i was like i was quite certain that she was a member of the basquiat family she looked too much like her uncle i was like uh you got to be kidding me man and if this chick is not uh you know a family member i don't know you know who is but but the thing about it is i had not seen her in any of the videos or i hadn't recognized her or remembered her from the videos that i had watched you know, of the family members. So basically I didn't recognize her. I didn't know who she was. I just took a chance and I was like, wait, excuse me, are you a member of the family? And she was like, yeah, I am. And she's like, how'd you know or whatever? And I'm like, I was like, what? Like, come on now. You look just like your uncle, you know? I was like, come on, you look just like your uncle, whatever. So I was like, would you mind, would you please sign my, um, my book? This was a different night, y'all. I'm talking about a different night completely. That was, yeah, this this was all a completely different night. This, this wasn't last night, right? When I saw Sophia. No, 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 no. But, and yeah, she was, Sophia wasn't there. More of the family members weren't there. One one person, I believe it was uh, Lisan's uh, son, 
Yeah, it had to have been Lee San's um, son uh, who was there. Yeah, yeah, he was there. Um, but the others, the nieces and the granddaughter, no, nah, they weren't there. Okay, okay, so peep game, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I was like, yeah, Sophia looks like um, looks like her uncle. Um, I was like, I'm not going to walk in. I was like, you know what? I had already seen the exhibit, so I really wasn't excited to like go in there and, and see the work again. I was more so uh, interested in connecting, you know, with the family. And that was an opportunity when I saw Sophia standing, you know, standing at the uh, at the entrance near the entrance. And I was just like, yo, can I get your autograph? Can I get your signature or whatever? She was like, yeah. The other thing about it was this was on this was October 20th on the day that Sophia signed my book. But the thing about this was. I took the book with me in hopes of having it signed. You see, I did not know that the sisters, Lisan and Janine, had already held a book signing event. I didn't know that. And I just thought, hey, if the sisters are going to be there, I might as well bring my book. I might get it, get it signed. So I was carrying my book around all the night that I was at the exhibit and therefore um, a panel discussion. And at some point, Lisan, you know, told the crowd, hey, guys, we're tired. We're, we won't be signing anything. We weren't going to be um, don't please don't bother us with questions or whatever. We're tired. We've been up, you know, really early. Blah, 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 blah. And so. That's what happened. Once she said that, then like all of my hopes for getting my book signed that night were dashed. And luckily, Sophia had enough energy and she, you know, was she welcomed the opportunity to sign my book. So at least Sophia signed my book that night. But then again, I did get my book signed by an, uh, one of the panelists, uh, Jean-Michel's friend, uh, Toxic. Now, Toxic really, you know, put his thing, put his thing down because Toxic is a graffiti artist. But he and he right now, he doesn't even live in America. So the night that I met Toxic, I listened to him and I was in the presence of Janine Lisan, uh, the Basquiat family and Toxic, as well as Lee Quinones, you know. Um, I mean, that was a miracle just meeting him, just meeting uh, Toxic like that because he lives in France. He was only there because he had promised that to show up and, you know, share his stories and whatnot. So that was a really special thing. So that was like, that's like the icing on the cake for this, this book that I have. Toxic signed it. I have video footage of him um, tagging in my book. Sophia signed it. So, oh yeah, man, I got it signed. And then Lisan and Janine signed it. So yeah, this is a really sweet piece of uh, art and ephemera now. You're listening to the IC109 podcast. I'm your host, Larry Wiggs. You're at 109 right now. You're at 109 right now. Let's keep this party rolling. Um, so Lisan and Janine signed my book. We had a moment there. They geeked out when they learned that Sophia signed my book. Um, I, t uh, I told them, I told them that I brought gifts for them, and I did. So I whipped out, I whipped up, I, I, I threw together um, an art, an art catalog. I threw together this art catalog um, to display my artwork, to talk about um, the artwork, give some descriptions. And this work, I mean, this catalog was based upon the catalog that I received from uh, Milton Bowen's 510. And Milton Bowens is another artist who has been inspired by Basquiat, right? And of course, Milton Bowens has inspired me. I learned how to, you know, how to do some of the artwork that I've been doing recently, you know, after following his example. Um, of course, my story is unique. My story is 109. So I think I'm not an artist. I'm not an artist, but I'm using art as a medium to get my my story out there. 
It's the story of 10-9 that holds water. My artwork, you might look at it and say, meh. Or you might say, yeah, you got something here. Um, I try. I try, but it's the story. It's the story. It's about those moments when uh, I see those numbers. That's that. It's like, wow. It's like that. Um, so, so that's what it is, right? So I made the book, I'm looking at the book right now. And now that I've, I didn't have a lot of time. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time. I thought about what I was going to present and, um, I put it, I put the book together. I tried to write the descriptions, but I discovered that the descriptions it, for the sisters, for Lisan and Janine to, oh, and by the way, when I mention the sisters' names, I am mentioning Lisan's name first because she is older. She's eldest. The birth order. I'm, I'm mentioning their names in birth order. So Lisan was first and then Janine second. I'm not saying, you know, that I prefer Lisan to Janine. Like, like, who the hell am I anyway, you know? But no, that's that's not the case at all. Man, I, I really tell you, man, I really appreciate that moment with them because I just felt, you know, some good vibes coming from both of them. Just some really down-to-earth people, you know, and we were able to connect on, on the Sophia thing. But then my wife was with me. Randy was with me. And so Randy told them, mentioned that, you know, her family is from the Bronx, and so Lisa and Janine were excited. Oh my gosh, you're from New York. Oh, you know, got got a little New York connection going on, which is cool. Probably got some points that way, whatever. Yeah, man. But all right, to be critical, to to think to think about the night more critically, you know, I put together this um this catalog, which I only printed four copies. It it cost a lot too. I printed four copies and those four copies were um two of them were gifts. They were dedicated to Lisa and Janine. Their names are in there, dedicated to them, you know. I signed them both and uh yeah, it's dedicated to them. So and they looked, they looked inside and they were and and Lisa was like, "Ooh, okay." She's like, I'm going to, we're going to read that. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. You know, check it out. We're going to check out your work, which I appreciate it. The gals are busy. They are busy, but if they, you know, if, if, if no one gave them a gift, if no one gave them a, a, a gift, such as the, what I gave them, what I presented them, um, then I have a good chance that they might take it and say, Hey, Let's take a look at what he what he what he made and stuff like that. And then the other thing, the other idea is um like it's so personal. And I personalize it. I said, look, it's to Lisan and Janine. This book is for y'all. This book is for y'all too, you know. I made it for this day, for this occasion. So that should, you know, impress them and say, wow, he put some effort, some thought into this thing, you know, you dig. Yeah. So, uh, however, critically, you know, uh, to, to critically look at the book, yeah, I needed more time. I wish I had, uh, yeah, wish I had uh, more time so that I could also, um, so that I could, you know, proofread it a number of times and, and offer it to some other people to proofread and then offer some suggestions and critique what the heck I'm trying to say. Because, yeah, there are a couple of uh, sentences that are like, wait, let me read that again. What What is he saying? I don't understand why that's important. What what did he tell us? Oh, you, you should have spent a little bit more time explaining yourself there, you know. But it is what it is. But now that I have that catalog that art catalog i can expound upon it i can make it longer make it bigger add some new works to it uh i can um, proofread it i've got more time because it's not 
And then I don't have to personalize it to uh, Lisan and Janine for future uh, copies, future reference. I could, uh, you know, tweak it for the, the next event per se. You know, who knows? I don't know. But anyway. Um, but what I wanted them to come away with is this idea that uh, their brother painted a premonition. All right. And see, so here's here's why that was so important, because like, for one, they were in Los Angeles. The exhibit is in Los Angeles right now. It won't be there after January 1st, all right? But the exhibit is there. It was there in Los Angeles. All right, here in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles is where Jean-Michel came. Jean-Michel painted a lot of his artwork in Los Angeles. Peep game. I visited the studio in Venice where Basquiat lived. I found I found this um, I found an article about uh, his life. And I read it and then um, I saw the building and I went to the building. It's still the same building. It's still there. Um, you know, thirty some years later, it's still there. It looks a little different, but whatever. Um, so Los Angeles, Jean-Michel lived here and in 1982, 1982 was a very pivotal year for uh, Basquiat because it was a prolific year for him. He painted quite a, uh, quite a, a few of his works. Um, he had the benefit of traveling between New York and LA. So he would live in LA for two to three months at a time and then go back to New York and then he'd get away and, you know, come back to LA and stay for another two to three months at a time. This was made possible uh, because of his partnership with Larry Gagosian, the art dealer. And what I find interesting is that um, one of the works of art that Jean-Michel painted is this is my favorite, All Colored Cast Part Two, which the title even has sort of um, a Hollywood theme to it. All Colored Cast, right? Is he talking about a movie, Hollywood? It would seem it would seem that way. Uh, I I would presume that I I would you know I would guess that. Um, so anyway, those are the connections, uh, to this work of art. Jean-Michel possibly painted it in Los Angeles. Jean-Michel lived in Los Angeles and, you know, yeah. And then it was a prolific year for him as far as, uh, painting goes. Now, the other thing is the subject of the painting that, that, you know, the idea that I'm bringing to the table is that he painted Nipsey Hussle, who was born in Los Angeles, who lived in Los Angeles and became famous in Los Angeles. So that's the connection between the work of art that Basquiat created and Los Angeles or Basquiat's life in Los Angeles and the work that he created in Los Angeles that I say was a work paying homage to the the coming messiah figure the messiah figure ermius joseph nipsey hustle ask it down. now why how do i how do i explain this well i will say that jean michel's art was i guess cathartic jean michel's art was a display of his shamanistic energy I don't know what that means. I mean, I know what a shaman is, you know, a shaman. They're, 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 that's like a spiritual. It's kind of like a witch doctor. A shaman, you know, sees things that other people don't see. The shaman, you know, is dealing with other realms of reality, of 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 life, and so forth and so on. The shaman, okay? Don't forget, you're at the IC109 podcast. You're at 109 right now. Speaking of other worlds, you know, that's our legend who will never die, Kobe Bryant reminding us you know where you are you're at 109 right now yeah shaman shaman energy okay so you know look at the work 
and the work doesn't look like anything recognizable. But when you hear me describe these things, it's like, come on, I think I'm doing a pretty good job of describing these things and bringing you, bringing you where I want you to be. I want you to stand here to see the view that I see. Come, come stand, stand, stand here with me and let's look at this together, you know? So I'm looking at the book right now and the book has a, a couple of pages where on the left page, um, there's Jean-Michel's work, All Colored Cast, part two. And on the right, there's my work entitled uh, All Colored Cast, part three. All right. And so let me get into it, right? All right, let me just make it simple. Basquiat wrote Alexander the Great on his work. Well, on my work, I wrote Nipsey Hussle the Great. Why did I do that? Not only because Nipsey called himself the Great on his Twitter account. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, way to be humble, way to be, uh, what, meek? Modest, you know. Nipsey was not one for modesty, you know. <laughs> um, not so much that, but because uh, Alexander the Great was from Greece, where the first marathon comes from Greece. There's a connection right there with Nipsey because Nipsey named his company the Marathon Clothing, right? The Marathon Collective. The Mara he named his album the Marathon. And the, the catchphrase that he uses is the marathon continues. So there's a connection right there. But then um, outside of the painting, outside of what uh, Basquiat wrote, there's the uh, additional history of Greece that is also related to Nipsey. And that is the fact that um, the first marathon occurred when uh, Phidippides, and I actually made a mistake in another video. I thought it was Aristophanes. I said Aristophanes, but I, I, I was wrong. It's Phidippides. Well, Phidippides ran from the city of Marathon to the city of Athens to tell the citizens of Athens, the Athenians, that they were victorious in the Battle of Marathon. And all right, just got a, a message from my wife, Randy, saying good night. All right, good night. Let me message her back. I haven't had a moment like that in a while where uh, I'll, where I've been interrupted, kindly, kindly interrupted, you know, by my wife. It's always been something that we talked about. You know, Randy will say, "Did you?" Oh my gosh, I'm sorry I, I, I interrupted you while you were recording or something like that. I'm like, eh, it is what it is. This is impromptu, you know, extemporaneous, so it is what it is, right? So, as I was saying, um, yeah, so Phidippides, uh, you know, kind of like Paul Revere said, hey, you know, we're victorious in, in the city of Marathon. Now, his message his message was uh, Nike. I don't know if they pronounced it that way, if they just said Nike, Nike, or something like that. But Nike um, means victory. Now, the connection with Nipsey is Victory Lap is the name of his debut album, Victory Lap. He even um, made shirts, T-shirts, sweatshirts that say victory on there and hats. On So you can buy clothes that um, that Nipsey created with uh, the word marathon and victory on it. And if you know about the first marathon and if you know about um, the, the legend of Phidippides, well, you know that those are, you know, linked. Those are correlated with those two words, marathon and victory. All right. So that's that's something that you have to know. You've got to you got to do a little research on that, you know, to find that. But there it is. Jean-Michel Basquiat wrote Alexander the Great on his work of art, which was typical of, of uh, Basquiat because he always uh, what employed the use of uh, source material when creating work. 
And for some reason, you know, Alexander the Great spoke to him. You know, that 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 word, those those words, Alexander the Great spoke to him and said, here, put us on the on the canvas. And Basquiat followed up and said, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to write that. Alexander the Great, you got it. And here we are 30 some odd years later, 40 years later, and I'm decoding what he put on the canvas at that time, probably, definitely unbeknownst to him, right? The spirit was working through him, right? Okay, so we've got the Alexander the Great portion um, knocked out. We got that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we got the Nipsey Hussle the Great to uh to parallel what Basquiat wrote all right on the two works all right so then I guess I have to tell you how I discovered how I found this work like that's the that's a miracle in and of itself because Basquiat created thousands of works of art and I have not seen all of them but there's there's a reason why I focus on all color cast part two and that's because in this work of art, Basquiat wrote my numbers. You're at 109 right now. He wrote 109 on the painting, 109. And that caught my eye when I saw that work of art for the first time. And I was like, that's my work of art from now on. I've got to get it. I've got to, I've got to get a, a, a poster of it. And I chose the largest the largest um, scale of that poster. I wanted the biggest work because I knew Basquiat, you know, made these big works of art. I was like, I want, I want the biggest version of this work. So I, I got a, a big version of the painting, you know, created. I got it framed and all that kind of stuff. Um, anyhow, yeah, when I saw 109 on that painting, I was like, dude, I got to have that painting. And the crazy part about it, the crazy part about it that really solidifies the idea that it was a that it was a, a miracle finding this work is that I made the discovery of this work at 11:08 p.m. while I was watching I was watching the documentary. It was like 11:08 p.m. when I saw it come across the screen. I immediately jumped up, I grabbed my cell phone to take pictures of the to rewind the documentary, film the um, the the number one hundred and nine, take pictures of it, and then I started to create um, a post for Facebook to tell everybody, "Oh, I found one hundred and nine in my favorite artist uh, artwork." All of that took about a minute's time. So right when I'm ready to post this uh, this picture, uh, I notice that the time at which I'm posting it is. 11:09 p.m. Well, you know what? All right, I'm l let me let me let me trail that back. Cuz that seems too fantastical like all right, you see it at 11:08, you jump up, grab your cell phone and you're typing the message out and you discover, "Oh, look. You know, it's now 11:09." I think what happened is I might have seen it at 11:05. Because I had to jump up, grab my cell phone, rewind the video, find the the spot when, you know, uh, where they show it. And I also had to type out a little message. I had to type out a decent message for um, Facebook because when I type it out on Facebook, then, like, I share it with the world. And it's true then. When you share it on Facebook, it's real then. People know that you're not playing. You're not making stuff up. They see it too, you know? Um, so, so it probably took me a couple of minutes to write that message, to get the cell phone jump up or whatever, whatever. But I noticed that right when I was about to press, you know, upload, it was 11.09 p.m. And I was like, oh, snap. Look at that. Of course, I wasn't planning any of this. I didn't plan any of this at all. This is just how it happened, how it occurred. I'm checking my clock right now. It's a, it's 1025 right now. I don't see 109 anywhere. You know, I don't see any correlation. So I'm just rocking and rolling. So let me continue. Um, 
Yeah, so that's how I discovered this. That's how I found this work of art. But, you know, for everything that I'm talking about, I still did not make those connections until months later after finding this work of art. I didn't make the connections. I had to wait for the poster to arrive. I mean, when I, when I saw the DVD, I said, I got to have that picture. So I went online, I searched for it, and I searched for, uh, you know, posters. I went to allposters.com. I found that uh, poster. I said, I need that image um, printed out for me. I had to wait for them to mail it to me. That took a couple of weeks. And then after I had that, I put it on the wall. I looked at it. Uh, I tried to understand. I tried to de decipher what was in the painting. And aside from everything that I'm reading into the painting about Nipsey Hussle, there's plenty already there on the canvas that I was trying to read into it or trying to interpret it and trying to understand what the heck was going on. And I just find it, you know, really interesting, all of this stuff. All right, so I'll, let me just keep going. So Alexander the Great, Marathon, Victory. Nipsey Hussle, The Marathon Clothing, Victory Lap, debut album. 109, 109, 109, those are my numbers. And it's in that painting, like, wow, that's bizarre. Whoa, okay. Now, here's something else. That 109 that's in the painting, like, where did that come from? I spoke with Jean-Michel Basquiat's uh, school friend, Al Diaz, in 2022, September 2022. Al Diaz told me, hey, that's a number from like a library, like, you know, like the Dewey Decimal System or something. That was like the number uh, that you could find. It's a, it's a number that organizes um, stuff, right? And that might have been the number on, the, on a book, right? 2004 dot 109 dash 235 sic those are the numbers from you know those are the numbers from from a book right i'm like oh okay cool cool i, I get that probably have to go to the library to find that book huh to see to see what's going on with that maybe maybe have to do that um wait a minute usually when you find a book like, don't the books, like, they have the year? Like, there's there's the year that they were printed? No, no, maybe I'm tripping. Maybe I'm tripping. Because that two, that he, he wrote 2004 on his painting. But 2004 couldn't have been the year that the book was printed because we're talking uh, about a painting that was made in 1982. And 2004 couldn't have been the year 2004. So, ixnay on the 2004 as a year thing. But, but Al Diaz told me, hey, that's like a number for a book, which is really curious. Now I, I got to find that book. I got to figure out, man, what's going on? Like, what is that? What was Jean talking about? What was Jean-Michel talking about? All right. But 109 is in there. All right. Now here's where it gets spooky, right? Here's where it really picked, where it piqued my curiosity. So after I have this poster... After I have my 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 reproduction of uh, Jean's work in my home on my wall, that's when spiritually the spirits start to wake up, start to rise, and start to communicate with me. Because on a lonely evening, I was watching the television and I was I was watching my favorite Nipsey Hussle video for the umpteenth time, fifth the eleventh time, um, and then an image one that I hadn't noticed before comes across the screen and it's none other than Nipsey Hussle. And surprisingly, the numbers 109 are in that image as well. Boom, for real. No, he a genius, he just can't claim it. Yeah, that part. There it was. There it was for all to see, 109 and Nipsey. And, I, and then... I was, in one sense, I was excited to see that 109 was in a picture with Nipsey. 
Okay. Because no, no, no. I think the timeline was I found the picture. I found the 109 uh, picture with Nipsey. That's my wife again. <laughs> She's messaging me. Let me see. She said, really quick. Uh, swim classes. Nope. Mm-hmm. All right, she sent me a message here. Okay, so she's gonna. Re I just re responded to the tweet. She's gonna re respond to me. So we'll get another. We'll get another ding in a second. But um, what happened? The um. Okay, so she messaged me back. All right, so the uh, what am I talking about? Oh, I'm talking about the timeline. I'm talking about the timeline when I found Nipsey Hussle's uh, image with 109 on it. All right, my wife is my wife is messaging him. All right, all right, all right. Um, so, yeah, I'm talking about the timeline. So at, at some point I found the video 109 and Nipsey in it. Now, when I found that, given my experiences with 109 over the years, um, and plus given my experience with 109 and Nipsey, I was like, I, this brings everything together you know seeing nipsey seeing 109 in a picture oh well now i've got something to really work with i've got something that's really good now you're at 109 right now recording though <clears throat> i don't know if i'm going to be in the same uh mind frame if i'm going to have the if this stuff is mm. coming to me because i'm okay. you, you caught me at a moment where i'm like oh let me let me get on this topic so Mm -hmm. As I was saying, and for those of you who are joining the podcast right now, we were talking a minute ago, and you're joining the conversation because Randy called me. We remember your um those messages that you sent me; they were picked up during my recording because I was recording before. I was, you know, how when you um send me a message and it interrupts me during recording. Oh man, that happened twice tonight. <laughs> But it I'm was okay. So sorry. I incorporated it into the um the program, and so I had it. Uh, what you gonna call it? Uh, I explained. Is my wife calling me again? She's a mess. She's bothering me. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> oh, I didn't man. say it like that, of course. Nah. Okay. Okay. But what I what we were talking about? Okay. So yeah. So when I went to college, I realized that there's a class war. Mm -hmm. and that some uh, universities are established or were established to meet the demands of certain segments of society se certain mm -hmm. groups and um you know there certain universities certain schools are designed for certain tasks or certain educations um mm -hmm. and that's not my own like that's my that's my own personal experience that those are my words but i also mm -hmm. listen to um former black panther uh he's now deceased but he was a former black panther but he was an asian a japanese dude uh was it richard a richard aoki um is yeah, that richard um, aoki let me just make sure huh they oh wait, no i'm not gonna say anything because i want to yeah. say the wrong thing yeah, I said it right. Richard Aoki. So Richard Aoki has this, um, he did an interview and he talked about his life. And here's what he said. He said that there, he described the schools up north in Northern California, up there near Oakland. Um, I think Merritt College is the name mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of the uh, Black Panthers attended. Yeah. And he said that, you know, well, I can't even paraphrase what he said, but what, what I do remember him saying exactly was that 
for those students who went to a particular high school in um, in that area, like 70%, maybe 50, 50, between 50 and 70% of those students at that high school went to Berkeley, you know, Cal Berkeley. Got it. And so basically they were just, it was a, it was a class move. It was like, all right, if you're, if you, if you are so lucky to attend that high school, the chances are you will attend that university. Mm -hmm. And so that's just like, you know, everyone you see at that high school, you're going to see them at the, at the university. So imagine being on a track. All right, guys, you go to this elementary school that's going to lead to this middle school to this high school to the college mm -hmm. everyone follows that that same track that's and if everyone you know has the same friends and is part of the same groups and meetings and all that kind of stuff then you're just that's what you do and I so you know, and, and for what mom and mom and dad were doing for Kalisha and I was they were putting us in a particular, on a particular track, you know, that was, we were to end up at a university or at a college and hopefully at a better, you know, college or a university, um, you know, because that was, that was the perception. It was just better. You have to have a better education than a public. And a public school education because the public schools well you're not being challenged you're not being prepared you know and that doesn't apply to all public schools because there's some great outstanding public schools but that's of course you know but see all right going back to the you know what makes you is it is it the the school's name or is it you know the the student body because in my case i was relying i think on the name of the school thinking, oh, I'm a pilgrim school student. I'm I'm good. I don't have to work very hard. I'm I'm good. I'm already in. There was a lot of that. And that's that ego. And that's that's what makes you slack off. And that's what makes you, you know, not live up to your potential. Mm -hmm. You're not being challenged. So so there's yeah, there's an example. You could be, you could have a good education and be in a good environment and take it for granted. Whereas you could be in a rougher situation and know the value of what you're getting know the value of your teachers and then excel and outperform others so it's it's a matter of you know it's a matter of your your will and what what you are willing to do it doesn't matter you know yeah the environment nature versus nurture it's 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 still there um right but um I want to add something too when you're done. I can stop there. Okay, so knowing that, um, so for instance, my daughter Robin, I put her in both. She started out in private school, and then I moved to Orange County. She went to public school just for a few years, and then private school, and then she finished her last two years at public school by her choice. So. Basically, just knowing um, a lot of like kids and parents from both public and private schools or, or doing both, the combination. Um, and knowing the credential level, like I know times have changed, but I know like, for instance, like LA Unified or like some of the public schools, they require, require credentials of the teachers. Whereas some of the private schools, they could kind of like enforce their own rules, regulation, and they're able to weed out like some of the kids. Well, they can weed out or, you know, have like a safer environment for um, the most part. So you just don't get whoever's in the neighborhood. You can get kids that like are like, um, or families that are financially stable and they can afford these schools. So you kind of weeding out those kids, like, does that make sense? You know, you know what I'm trying to say, right? So basically, you're, um, from what I was told, like sometimes some of the teachers at some of these great name schools are not as 
educated as some of the you know required like like credential or um mm. you know what i'm saying like the background so you have like your your kid goes yeah to okay the, okay the all right i can speak to that i can speak to that point because like when i was in school at pilgrim mm -hmm. i was getting the impression that pilgrim was preparing us for like you know private colleges hopefully like ivy league and i was of this uh of the idea that oh if you went to a cal state you somehow You're lesser than yeah you right. you somehow didn't live up to the expectations that that pilgrim was was getting you preparing preparing you for and i felt like wow i'm really at the bottom of the barrel but when i realized that my teachers at pilgrim mm -hmm. were cal state graduates mm -hmm. i was like why the hell were you making us work so damn hard you guys were cal state you know but the you know the this uh education and schools are businesses so what they were doing the business like pilgrim what they what they were doing is basically finding cheap people or cheap not people but cheap uh mm -hmm. employees like hey we need someone to do the job make it look pretty make them look like make them seem like we're we're aiming them for the for the top it's like what is it we don't you know you know i mean like yeah if you're if you're in, if you're running a business you're not going to you don't want to pay the you know you don't want to spend all your money on your on your on the human resources you want to undercut you want to keep your cost low so you're like hey if that guy who isn't qualified can do the same job as the guy who's qualified why do i have to pay the guy who's qualified what he's worth when i could pay far less to this guy who can still do you know do the job I, right exactly so it that's a whole nother like this conversation can go into it can go into like another conversation to another conversation and it could just branch off but um right and so for instance like my family I have a lot of crossroad crossroads member the school in santa monica um so a lot of my family members they went to crossroads and um what am i trying to say i was told that from my younger cousins that yeah they didn't even teach them um, how to um, tell time like basic things that were taught to us well for your short time in the public school but see that's where the conversation it gets kind of like like it, it all depends on the school, the teacher. Um, so it, 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 there's so many factors to take into consideration, but you know, like some of those like independent schools, like they want a more like, I'm not, I'm not speaking to all the schools cause they all have like different criteria, but a lot of them, like they want you to have a, like a more freer, like learning environment where you can call the teacher by their first name instead of like miss well i don't know how it was at pilgrim but i know i I, that, I, I don't even feel comfortable calling <clears throat> people who are you know authority figures you know by their first name even when i was working in korea and i had colleagues they were like just call me by my first name i'm like Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> what it's awkward right very i it, when i studied martial arts it was always sir right and the first time i called um mr alan kaplan um sir when i was uh at hamilton high school he was like whoa i like that <laughs> and that distinguished me from you know so many other students and he was like whoa that's good but see the thing about mr kaplan was i don't think he, kaplan was doing whatever the hell he thought was the right thing to do but he wasn't prepared <laughs> He did have, you know, uh, ideals about his students. And although he said that he was trying to help his black students by trying to be like, hey, wake up, you got to work hard. You got to get out there because they're taking it away from you. And although that was a good message, he wasn't prepared for a young black kid like myself who, you know, was getting a good education from Pilgrim. 
I and at Hamilton, I was prepared for what what Hamilton was 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 giving me. So it wasn't like he had to give me that speech. It wasn't like he had to say, you got to work hard. I was like, bro, I'm already doing that. I'm already there. Like, I need you to guide me, bro. Tell me, tell me what to do, what not to do, man. And he was just like, well, I don't know. I got to talk to all these other, these other folks who need my help. <laughs> you got to wake up, you, gotta, you know, because I read a paper that I wrote for Kaplan and I was like, damn, this is a pretty damn good um, paper for, um, for high school. And I remember him asking me, he was like, are you sure you want to, you want to title your paper that? Cause my, the title of my paper was, um, what is it? Life, Liberty and Freedom. Uh, no more. Like it was like death, slavery and life, liberty and freedom. Uh, liberty and freedom are the same something, but it was like death, slavery and something forevermore. So we were trying to argue something about um, the effects of maybe uh, of reconstruction, the civil war. And I was like, I was like, we're still not free. There is no freedom. And it was a very miserable, um, you know, outlook. And he was like, are you sure you want to name your, 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 your paper that? And I was like, yeah, that's what I see. That's, that's what I, that's what I think of, you know, but anyway, um, but he wasn't prepared, you know, for us, for me. And I came to him and I was like, guide me. And he was just like, well, he did tell me he was like, come back. He was like, you know, come back, uh, to visit me, but I never did. Oh, and then he he passed away he passed in away. like 2015, 16, 15, I think. Oh, there you didn't go and visit him. Yeah. And then it was also, yeah, things get complicated because you like, I wanted to come back and, you know, stick my chest out and be like, yeah, I, I went to a UC. I went to, you know, a good school. And I'm just like, yeah, my grades. And you did go to a good school. Yeah. But my grades weren't weren't really good, and I was just like, like I'm, I was just, I felt like I was just floundering, like, ah, uh, man. I'm but we already, it. the world may not know your story, but we already know that you basically went and decided to choose a major that was totally opposite of what you like are were prepared with, for. Like, yeah. for, right, that's what I'm trying to say. And so you did it. It was a challenge, and you conquered it. it doesn't matter how long it took. It doesn't matter. You know, you know, well, your grades, yeah, it was challenging, but you did it, and so that's an accomplishment within itself. Yeah. But I want to go back to when you said um, he wasn't prepared for you. Are you saying because you came from this great school called Pilgrim that prepared you, and you're already doing great things there, and then when you uh, attended Hamilton? and had his class, like you're already like at a certain level. Is that what you're trying to say? No. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just saying that um, he, all right, I guess, I guess Kaplan had preconceived notions. Well, okay. So Kaplan worked with, yeah, so, hmm? mm -hmm. was that? I was going to bring up something. Are you, are you going to bring up race or this has, you don't, it's not important for this conversation. Kaplan was all about race. Kaplan, well, Kaplan talked about race. I mean, he was a Jewish but man. But he's not a black man. He, exactly. So there's so I was just, I just wanted to point that out for people that were listening. I, I wasn't sure if that gotcha. had anything to do with what you're about to say. Gotcha. Yeah. So Kaplan um, was, was uh, a Jewish man and his heart was in the right place um, because his message was, um, you know, look at the writing on the wall. If you're black, you know, society is working against you. Mm -hmm. um, and so you need to, you need to be prepared for, you know, what's coming. But the message was for everyone, everyone really, okay. because uh, okay. the idea that, you know, a college degree is, is sufficient, 
you know, really isn't when you have to get a master's, you have to get a PhD, you have to do all this other type of stuff. Um, but, um, but Kaplan, so the, what I, what I meant was, I think Kaplan had some preconceived ideas because he worked with all of the students, the different schools at Hamilton. And so at the original school, there were students who just didn't care. They were maybe members, members of gangs. They would show up, just had to show they weren't attending classes. Like he saw the real, the real effects of, of our society, I suppose. Can I interrupt you? I know what the Mm -hmm. original school is, but for those that are listening, you're talking about the original or the regular side versus the magnet side, correct? Yeah. Is that what you're trying to say? Okay. Yeah. Because the original school was just, hey, that's the school everyone goes to. Right. But then you had, yeah, you had another track. And mm-hmm. you had those students who who were in magnet programs in elementary and middle school who were being tracked into or continued their magnet education at the high school level. Mm-hmm. And so for Kaplan, you know, I think what what was what he was saying to us, you know, even though we were in the magnet program is he was saying, hey, I don't know. Maybe he was lamenting. Maybe he was, uh, you know, complaining to us like, yeah, the students in the original school, well, they're going to have a tough time. But you magnet students, you guys aren't going to. I don't think he ever said that because it, whenever he spoke to us the, in the magnet program, it sounded as if he was just saying to all of us, yeah, you know, the black students are, are going to, you know, need to wake up. And, and he was a very, you know, pro-black um, dude, you know. But what I meant by he wasn't prepared for me is, like, his message was, hey, if you're black, you, you got you to gotta work harder. Right, which is reality. And the idea that, I mean, because there was... I mean, there was Arius, there was uh, Dale, Nicholas, Stevan, uh, Terrence. I mean, there were a lot of us. Regina. I don't know if they were in the magnet or whatever, but a lot of them, we were in the same uh, programs and we had the same classes. And, um, I just think that like those, I don't think he had to worry about what he was talking about with us. We didn't Mm -hmm. have, we, we weren't, we weren't going to be the ones in that, in that boat, in that position where it was going to be really dicey. Mm -hmm. Um, We were going to go to college. We were going to do, you know, what we were going to do. Now, if he wanted us, now, if he, if he was saying, I want you guys to be great. And you guys have to be great right now. Well, yeah, he had reason to tell us, hey, even, you know, you black kids are you're going to have a, a hell of a time, you know, because, yeah, being great is is not easy. But if he was just mm-hmm. saying, hey, you know, just surviving is going to be difficult. And it was like, Kaplan, chill out. Like, we're working our butts off right here. We are not those students that you have in those other classes. We're, we're right. not we're not them. So that's what I mean. Like it was a mis a misinterpretation or a misreading. The, his message okay. was the same. His message was the same across all of his audiences. But mm-hmm. I think for us, it wasn't. It was inappropriate. It was like, come on. Um, you said it was inappropriate or was not inappropriate. Yeah, it was inappropriate. It, it wasn't. A, it wasn't the proper match. Like, got it. He was on this kick about, hey, this is what you have to do to to survive. And it's like, mm-hmm. bro, you're talking, you might be talking to a black guy, but I don't have this, I'm not living that life that you that you presume all of us right. are living. So that's what I was getting at. Like, did he assume that you were a certain kind of like let's just say it, like, you know, black guy, like the tip I, I don't even want to say typical because that could be a stereotype. Like just an assumption of what a 
black, you know, typical guy is. I mean, when I say typical, I'm using the quotes, the, the air quotes, like, you know what I'm trying to say. I mean, that, that, that may have been the case um, because I didn't have a lot of contact with him. Um, outside of, you know, being in his class, being a student, maybe, um, asking him, you know, a question here or there. Um, I remember, you know, I, I did ask him, I like, uh, maybe at a lunchtime or maybe, no, I think it was after school. I asked if I could talk with him privately and we talked and, um, and there were other, other times when, um, you know, I, I was able to get one-on-one attention from him. Like I was asking them to um, help me, you know, write my essay, give me some ideas and some pointers and, and what have you. But I, I think that even with the, um, with, I mean, cause I was doing that, you know, to show, they say, you know, you gotta get to know your teachers. You've got to show your interest, you know, it, when you're in college build a rapport with your teacher so they know you they know that you're you know you're right. striving you're trying to do your best and stuff like that so i was doing that with okay. kaplan um i don't know i mean i mean he had a lot of students so i don't who knows what he thought about me you know but i what and you know just like uh yesterday when we went to um and we met lisan and janine Right. Like, I don't know, I don't know what, what their reception, what their impression of me, you know, was. And I don't know, I know we had a moment there and I know that, um, I know that from my perspective, I did all that I could have. Right. I met them, I gave them, you know, a gift. I, so it's like in the case of, um, you know, my high school teacher, Mr. Kaplan, I met him. I guess halfway. I said, look, I'm going to do your assignments. I'm going to come to you to talk to you. So you know who I am. I'm not just, you know, this, this lone black kid in your class. I'm going to show you that I want, you know, to improve yada, yada, yada. And, um, so maybe that was, maybe that set the, the tone and, and gave, uh, gave him an impression of who I was more so than what he might've assumed about me because of, you know, what I look like, because the, like the one thing that really, I remember the one thing that like really pissed me off when I was at Hamilton is they gave me the, um, most improved student award. Most improved as far as academic, like grades or. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, one year they were like, they were like, oh, Larry's grades weren't so good at, at some point. And then he 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 buckled down and he 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 brought his grades up and and we all noticed that he did that. And so we wanna um we wanna give him uh you know his props, you know. So they gave me an award and gave me the award. It was, you know, it was a it was a a class assembly like at the end of our, you know, our graduate near graduation. And they were like, and Larry Wiggs, most improved student. And I was like, yeah, I had a little chip on my shoulder. I was like, you motherfuckers, I went to pilgrim school. I can handle this work. They are going to tell me I'm a, I'm most improved. Man, I'm better than that. To, yeah. Because you went to the private school. I went to pilgrim. I'm better than that. Yeah. That's then, good. You should be proud. That's a great school. Kaplan gave me a hug and, uh, but I think at that same assembly, like, uh, Smolin, Smolin, um, saw me with, uh, mom and dad and he was just like, mm, don't know that guy. Don't know them. We were walking in the door and I thought, oh, Smolin's going to stop and let my family go and be like, oh, you nice folks go right ahead. Smolin just kept going inside the door and not even acknowledging mom or dad, just like, oh, I'm not talking to them. I was like, no way. Yeah. Wow. Like, I was like, man, I thought that dude was cool. He's an asshole. My teacher. That was my color. Yeah, that was my um the uh, English teacher. And he got he's the one who got caught for like a sexual case or whatever with the student like a few mm. years ago. Mm. But <laughs> that's not good. No bueno. I was gonna just say something really quick, but just going back to like the most improved like award, like 
I always have to remind like my um, the clients that I work with, like I kind of work with a lot of teenage students that are like sometimes their grades are failing or not doing, you know, are not the best. It's not representative of your knowledge because we all know that. Well, for those who know you, you're very knowledgeable. You know, you're well traveled. You read a, you read a lot of books. You do a lot of, like like research as far as like looking up things on the internet, YouTube. So you're very knowledgeable. And then I don't know when you receive that reward, award, excuse me, I said reward, <laughs> award. Um, was it like your first year? Because sometimes your first year entering um, high school, you're trying to adjust. And, you know, especially coming from the private school, going back into the public school system. So maybe that, you know, just needing needing that time to adjust. Hold when on. did you? Uh, okay. No, nah, that was, um. no, that was like junior or senior year. So it was. Yeah. <laughs> junior writers, senior writers. <laughs> something. Yeah, it was uh, it was late. It, that was not a, a freshman year thing. That was when we were graduating so, or close to it near graduation. But um, then, uh, I mean. But I already know you had the TV situation, like the interruption, like, oh, we got to go, Larry. Like, this is inside conversations that we have. Oh, yeah. About, yeah, so, you know, sometimes like, maybe we're not getting the studying that you wanted to get accomplished you know you have a lot of like distractions yeah and when i i mean even when i was in high school and when i noticed that you know uh our nigerian counterparts the obuna mary family was at the library after school like that really like initially it was like I guess in freshman year of high school, it was like, why are you guys doing that? But then by senior year, it was like, oh, snap. You guys are going to these excellent universities. You guys aren't playing around. Wow, you guys have been doing this all that time. Yeah, I started going to the library. I started spending a little bit more time in the library. But then the problem with going to the library for me like with their family, I believe, um, you know, they had an older sibling and there were like at least four, there were at least four, um, four siblings. So they could all, you know, jump in the car together. The oldest would drive them to the, the library, I think. But in our case, you know, it was just Kalisha and I. So we were like, if I wanted to go to the library, I have to drive myself. So we're talking, I had to pay for my own gas. You know, if I got hungry, then I'd have to, you know, figure that situation out in addition to just studying there. Motivation as well, trying to get there, like mentally, just get your mind in that space. Like, okay, I got to drive there. Then I have to, you know, and then, check out, like, yeah, all of that. And then um, didn't want to be alone there. So I would go bring some friends. I remember I brought Dale with me one time and, that wasn't a, the best idea because Dale was excited. He was like, yo, go. Like, I don't know if he's if he told me to go fast. And I was driving down the street to get, we were just one block away from the um, Inglewood Library. And I was driving fast. And I didn't notice that there, um, that there were some bumps in the road. And uh -huh. I'm driving this, this uh, jalopy. And we hit and we, we go up. And then we come down and we come down really hard. And then the car dies on me as soon as it hits. It's boom. Zzz. And I'm like, fuck, man, what am I going to do now? So we had to, I had to call AAA. And that was on the way to the library. So our trip to the library was canceled because I had to call, you know, someone to jump my car or, you know, to tow us. And, um, but usually, yeah, you, you try to go with friends, but then it ends up being a party. You're just talking about other things, distracting each other. And maybe you get your Girls. homework. That too. Mm -hmm. And maybe you get your homework done, but you're not spending your time, you know, efficiently or wisely. Efficiently, right. Like, man. So. Yeah. 
it can be challenging being a young teenage boy. Yep. So, yeah, and Dale, I remember when Dale asked me to, what was it? Asked me to drive him to um, the Santa Monica Pier. And uh, because he was going to go apply for a job. (laughs) Like, I thought we were going to hang out or something. And he's going up there to apply for a job. He's like, all right, thanks, Larry. I apply for a job. I'll probably get that one. And I was like, dude, you can't, you, you, you told me, you, you basically had me drive you up to your, your interview, up to your uh, location, man. Didn't pay me or anything, no no gas money or something like that. He was like, yo, Larry, let's go oh, to the no. pier. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like fun, dude. Let's go. He goes, Wait, you still talk with him? No, nah, I saw Dale uh, around COVID. I saw him at the Grove. He was there with, with his dad. Like, you you know, you hear things from, uh, I either saw him on, um, on Facebook or I saw him on um, Instagram. You know, I mean... It's all good, but it was just like those things that happen, you know, those things that happen. But I was too, I was too kind with, um, you know, with, with my, I was too generous with my car because I had a car and no one else did. And it was like, right. I know that feeling. Like the time Hassan, Chris and Kimani and I were on our way to the, um, Venice Beach. beach. I had oh, the car. No. I had the car. And I was like, let's roll. Then we got into an didn't accident. Make it to the beach. Didn't make it there. Nope. At the infamous. You didn't make it to the library or the beach. Yeah. At the infamous intersection of uh, Walgrove and Venice. Yeah. Wow. That, that accident. Yeah. So, well, yeah, education, private, and um public can lead to many different endings or different things as we are talking about right now. Yep. So before that I was talking about um I was like re excuse me, I was recounting, retelling, reviewing uh last night's meeting with Lisan and uh, Janine and I made another video and I was listening to that video and I was like, I didn't, it wasn't a bad video. I did a pretty good job of explaining, you know, what I was talking about. It didn't sound crazy. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that you couldn't understand. It was quite clear. And I was like, yeah, I did that well. Just I Wait. didn't I didn't get any views on it. Hmm? Are you I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly. So you made a video discussing your the event that we went to the other day? No. So this podcast that's recorded right now, I okay. started by talking about last night. Right. Um but also I recently, tonight, I watched another video I made uh, five months ago. Okay. And um, I thought you mixed your event. Are you talking about the event? Oh no, no, this is just this is just another um, another video. video. Yeah, this got just, it. Okay. And when I listened to that video, I thought, wow, you know, it sounds interesting and it's pretty um, pretty straightforward and clear. Although I didn't get many views I, I don't think i got any views on that video and i thought okay. wow let's just wait <laughs> and i was like wow well uh it's a good video i mean there are reasons why videos don't get picked up it's because you know the the, the way that you advertise them uh the wording the words that you use to describe them in right. your title you know all of these things can attract people to the video so right. maybe I didn't have those. I didn't check those off the um, off the uh, uh, marketing plan. I didn't do a good job of that. But for the video itself, you know, I can't beat myself up for not you know executing a good video because it was it was pretty good. It was pretty good. 
right um, you always have like really good material and so remember we had a conversation the other day like sometimes you know videos are not getting the likes or the views because it's not sex alcohol drugs violence death whatever that's very yeah appealing but it can be very great to be very knowledgeable great information all of those great things but you know if it's not like that cheap thrill whatever you want to call it then sometimes it will just take longer to obtain those likes and views all right so um, so i'm going to recap a little bit more now that you're here uh all right so a recap so all right so the these works of art are similar because Basquiat wrote Alexander the Great on it. And he could have chosen any great figure, any great historic figure to write, but he wrote, he chose Alexander the Great. Right. The correlation to Nipsey Hussle is that Nipsey called himself the Great. And it may have been after Alexander the Great, but it could have also been after Catherine the Great or some other great person who named themselves the great but Mm -hmm. alexander the great is pretty popular so maybe nipsey knew of it and just went with alexander the great it's like all right that's my man i'm nipsey hustled the great you know sort of whatever right but not only is that similar but alexander the great was from greece where the first marathon uh was was run oh marathon right so nipsey's brand was is the marathon clothing um he's produced he's uh put out clothing that says basically marathon on it hats shirts socks you name it um lighters right the the name of the album marathon yeah it's all there then um the legend of uh, Phidippides is one that says that Phidippides was the first marathoner and his goal was to run from the city of Marathon to the city of um, Athens to tell the Athenians that they were victorious. So his message was victory. Now the correlation with Nipsey is Nipsey's first um, uh, debut album was called Victory Lap. Victory Lap, right. So we have all of these connections already, you know, between Nipsey Hussle and yeah. Alexander the Great. All right. So that's that. Then I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, in this painting, the painting has 109 in, in the painting, which caught my eye. And when I met with Al Diaz, Al said that that's the number that comes from like, um, like a Dewey Decimal System. It's from a it's from a book. Something like that. So one I said zero, one zero nine, one oh nine. Yeah, the number is uh two zero zero four or two thousand four dot one zero nine dash two three five. Oh, uh, you're right. So, yes. So there's more there, but one zero nine is in there, okay. Mm-hmm. But my point was, hey, when I saw this painting and I saw one oh nine, it caught it caught my eye because I have a a long history with the number 109 and it it caught my eye when I saw it in the painting. So vividly, it was like, oh, look, there's 109 in this painting. Now for the painting to have the correlations that we're talking about to Nipsey, that's what makes it so bizarre. But then what's even more bizarre and what's, you know, what's miraculous is that I was able to find a picture of Nipsey that almost mirrors the painting. Right. I know. Yeah. Yeah, That's crazy. That part is so crazy. It's like, wait a minute. Now the, now Jean-Michel Basquiat's painting is looking more like the picture Mm -hmm. that was taken. And it couldn't, the timeline isn't right because the painting was made in 1982, but then the picture was probably taken in 2000 and 13 14 some right. sometime or something like this um the other thing though i mentioned this bef- before we started our conversation randy okay so i'm just recapping here um okay 
Basquiat's painting was created in 1982, and that was the year, that was a really good year for Basquiat's art because like, he lived in Los Angeles, in Venice, um, like two to three months at a time. So he would stay in LA for two to three months, go back to New York, stay a month maybe, and then come back to LA and stay for two to three months, some on and off. And it was during that time that he created um, this work of art. So this, there's another idea that he created a work of art in Los Angeles where the person that I say is in the picture, like that's where he was born. So basically, Nipsey was born in L.A., and Basquiat created the work of art in L.A. So there's that connection. Oh. So for us oh. to have met, you know, his sisters yesterday in Los Angeles, for them to have even brought the the show to Los Angeles was like it was like coming full circle. It was the um, right. it was a return to. Uh, you know, a spiritual locale. As that's how I would I would like to phrase it because everything that's happened after Nipsey's passing, you know, is is really like, you know, significant. It's like it's uh I mean everything before, but also everything after is just like, wow, this this is bugging. Especially again, the exhibit, the Basquiat exhibit opened on the same day that Nipsey was killed. Oh, that's right. You did say that. On the four-year anniversary, on the same day. So March 31st, 2019, Nipsey was killed. March 31st, 2023, the Basquiat exhibit opens. Like, that was a head-scratcher. You know, I'm like, wait a minute. How did they choose that date? I wish I had asked them that question when we were, when we met them. I asked them about that video, but that was another question I have. Like, why did you choose that date? Do you know what city you're in? Do you know what that that date, what happened on that date? And then I would have been able, do you know that your brother painted this guy who killed, who, who died on that particular date in this particular city? Ladies, come on. Do you see what your brother was doing? Your brother right. was, your brother was a shaman. He was, uh, he was a vessel through which like, the Holy Spirit, this 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 universal spirit was working through him to communicate. I don't know. <laughs> no, right? No, no, no. I I get it. All right. So that's where I want to go with all this kind of stuff. But then, all right. So what's crazy is that the painting then, Basquiat talks about body parts. And he could have chosen any body part. He could have chosen, he could have written the spleen, the heart, could have uh, written the kidneys, could have put the stomach spine he could have done all of that stuff but he chose he chose to he chose the uh the parts of the body um the the organs that nipsey had been uh shot in and subsequently died from his injuries uh too so no are you serious yeah so I'm sorry, i didn't hear you talk about that so in basquiat's um work yeah, he's he's also he's often um, drawing, you know, the body because the story goes when he was a kid, his mom gave him Gray's Anatomy to read and it forever, you know, uh, impressed him. So in his works of art, he's always drawing body parts. But okay. in in this work of art, he writes uh, chest. Mm -hmm, right. And he writes liver and lungs. Mm -hmm. And so the chest cavity is where your liver and lungs are located. They are the largest organs uh, under the chest cavity, your liver and lungs. And Nipsey's uh, liver and lungs were punctured by the bullets that, um, that, were, that were shot, that were fired at him. So, so you have this, in Basquiat's painting, you have a male figure, you have 109, you have the word chest, you have the word liver, you have the word lungs, and all of that relates to Nipsey. Wow. I in, see. in addition to Alexander the Great, who Marathon and Victory are related to, but they're also related to Nipsey. Okay, so we got all that working for us in this in this one work of art that I only know exists because I saw 109 one night 
And when I found it and I saw 109 on that artwork, I jumped up, grabbed my cell phone, started typing a message to post it on Facebook so that I would have evidence of what I found. And when I go to post it to Facebook, I'm posting it at 11.09 p.m. Which 109 is within? 109 is, is in nine. that time. And okay. so, And so I was like, oh, my gosh. Crazy. Like, <laughs> I was like, that's cool because I've never had a moment that was so in sync like that, where the, mm -hmm. where, where like at least two things or maybe three things are 109 related, you know, and they all sort of like collapse in on themselves. You know, I'm like, no, that's, that's, that's crazy. So anyway, but then there's more to this um, painting. So Basquiat wrote the number 47. 47. So I was saying four plus seven equals 11. Okay. And there were at least 11 bullets that were fired because the police reports, the news reported that Nipsey had been shot at least 10 times. Okay. And there was another person who was shot, Carrie Lathan, and that was an additional bullet. One bullet hit him. So that's 10 for Nipsey and one for this other guy. So there you have mm -hmm. 11, 11 bullets. But then I thought about it and I thought maybe um, Basquiat was uh, paying homage to his sisters because maybe when he says 47, maybe he was, uh, maybe it was a code for like 1964 and 1967 because in 1964, his sister Lisan was born. And in 1967, Janine was born. So 64, right. 67, 4, 7. So maybe that was a reference to his sister's birthdays. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But regarding Nipsey, it's the number of bullets that failed him. Then there's, okay, here's something um, interesting. So uh, Basquiat writes paw, paw, like a, a paw print, like, a, right. like a, a dog. Now, all right, the word dog is the word God backwards. Okay. All right. But paw is what you would call a dog's foot. Right. A dog's foot. All right. So if we're not talking about a dog and we reverse those words and we're talking about God, and we're talking about God's paw. And what I'm talking about is Nipsey was Jesus. So Nipsey was a son of God. Like, I, I don't even want to say stuff like that because that just sounds like so blasphemous and so like crazy to even say. But I mean, that's kind of, yeah, that's the right. idea. Yeah. Right. I know we had these conversations, so I, I get it. But um. But, it's something for um your listeners to think about, like if they do your your YouTube channel yeah. and listen to your podcast, they'll they'll understand where you're coming from. So, all right. So, dog is uh God is dog backwards. So the paw is the foot. Okay. So if the if it's not a paw that we're talking about, but if it's a foot that we're talking about on a human, and if we're talking about Nipsey's foot. Well, the, the 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 report says that Nipsey was shot in his foot as well. So there's. Did they say which foot? Did they say which foot? I'm just I, curious. I don't oh, okay. know. I was just wondering. So okay. the foot. So there's a paw. Maybe instead of saying, you know, you have to do oh. some mental mm -hmm. gymnastics, mm -hmm. and make to, in order to make it fit in order to make it work you gotta th you have to think outside the box think abstractly so paul mm -hmm. all right so there's that and then there's um the flat line or the ekg reading so right it looks like an ekg and then flat line like what was alive is now dead kind of thing right all right now basquiat wrote china which is an asian country he wrote china on the uh on the painting but that picture that i say that the painting looks like well that picture was taken in japan and japan right. japan is an asian country in country right 
And then oh. Basquiat wrote Haiti, which is his father's country. Right. So I said, all right, well, Basquiat wrote Haiti for his father's country. But what about um, Nipsey's um, mm-hmm. father's country? So I put Eritrea. Mm-hmm. All right. So I did all of that. I did all of that, put all this stuff together here. Um, there are still some other uh, details that I didn't mention. Still, you have to do a little bit of mental gymnastics with it or whatever. Right. Like the FKGD, which looks like fuck God. Right. But that, that was actually the name of a, that was the ticker symbol, the stock ticker symbol for a company that was released, that was uh, went public in the 80s. But instead of FKGD for Nipsey, it's God will rise because that's what Hermius's name meant or whatever. Mm-hmm. All right. So the last thing, something that I noticed about this painting is this. All right. To be a Crip, a member of the Crip gang, right? Somehow, like, Crips will wear uh, blue bandanas on their heads. Crips are going to, it's like, on their mind, everything is blue. Mm-hmm. It's an obsession. It's compulsion. You know, when they're speaking, they don't say Crips will. Okay. Even when spelling words, they will not uh, write the word with the C, uh, C-K. Because C-K means Crip killer. And that me- that okay. gives that gives power to their enemies. Oh, okay. So there's there's that. Um, so they're very mindful about blue, about the color blue, mm-hmm. because that's their color. That's that's their gang. That's what they roll with. It's blue, blue on right. their mind. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, after saying all of that, what color did Basquiat paint on the forehead of this male figure in this um, in this painting? Blue. Exactly. Wow, a lot of like, a lot of connections, correlations, connections, parallelism, all of that. He didn't. He didn't put it red, and I mean, like everything. Everything basically points to and links up with Nipsey. So, and then. There's this um, lightning bolt. There's this. Oh, yeah. There's a lightning bolt in this picture, which, in other paintings, uh, Basquiat has uh, has uh, painted. But when he painted that, he wrote Thor as the like. Uh, mm. well, it's not a Nordic. I love- a Nordic god, I think. Okay. Thor. Was was some sort of god? Very big, strong. Yeah, yeah. But the thing about Thor is, it didn't originate in like Nordic countries. Thor comes from Africa, and Thor. Oh, I know that. Thor is based upon Shango, the African. Shango. He's a African uh, Orisha. Oh, it's not what is, it's who is. Okay. Yeah. And the 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 thunderbolt is uh a reflection of uh of Shango's power, his strength. Right. But wow. so he has this icon of a Yoruban god. He's got the name of a company or the ticker symbol of a company that looks like it's saying, you know, F God. Mm-hmm. And and the, the whole idea that I'm trying to convey is that Nipsey was Jesus. I don't know. It's all of these things are too connected. And, you know, it's just like, that's, that's what I'm, hold on for a second. Let me, let me stop the recording and get back into it. Yeah. So. There's a lot. There's... Yeah. So that's what I see. That's the the perspective. That's what I want other people to to see and to be like, oh my gosh, 
yeah, look, I can I can see it too. For you to see those things, that's very like like it's mind blown. It's 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 crazy, like in a good way. And um yeah, I guess so what I guess what I've done is I've taken you down the rabbit hole the rabbit hole like come here come down the rabbit hole and, and look at look at all of these details and 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 follow me and and listen because what's what isn't so crazy what is not crazy about this is like i turned on a video tonight and i was listening to a discussion of some other artists work okay and I mean, these were professionals. These were people of, you know, you know, standing, you know, they, they, they work in the art field or whatever, or they're professors and they're talking. And basically the professors are like, come with me down this rabbit hole. We're going to psychoanalyze this uh, work of art. Here's what I see, you know, that's what the guy was doing. And I was like, look, they're doing it too. <laughs> they're it making all these, the yeah, mm -hmm. they're making all these connections and who knows if they're right or not, if they're right or not, but it. But it's what you see, the connections you see and others may see as well. And they're, they're, whatchamacallit, they're, and they're, uh, and their interpretation I mean, it's it's just as uh, valid as anyone else's, you know. It's their opinion. It's it's what they see. It's it's whatever. Mm -hmm. It's whatever. Right. So and that's the beauty of art and other things. Mm -hmm. Art too. Janelle asked me to take her to the airport for like. Got to pick her up at six six fifteen in the morning. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh well, yeah, yeah. I gotta get early to drop off my cousin's wallet at Gary's house. Yeah, but it was a um, it was a fun opportunity. Yeah, I'm just like kicking myself because I'm I'm noticing like some errors in the book, and I'm like, really? I hope they don't judge me too harshly, and they're like, I'm not reading this. You know? No, I yeah. think when they have time, they're probably overwhelmed right now. And I think once they get situated, or maybe they already have had a chance to like sit down and like look at a, a few, like look through it. But I think someone's gonna read it and like be like, wow, you know, you took the time out to make this book for them. Yeah, I hope and... so. Yup, yup, yup. Yeah. Yep. Which I think is pretty cool. Did you see their faces? They were like, wow. They were like so like in awe. Like just like for us, like it was pretty cool. I wish I could have recorded it. It was really nice. That's where you were there. I was like, that was a, that was very good. No, I didn't see them. Like oh. no, it was, yeah. it was, yeah, it was a very, it was a very good moment. It was really nice. I, oh, that was it was really special for you. I was I was shy and scared. I'm I'm just scary, but it was just being in the presence of the family members, the sisters of you know of him. Just it's like wow. The the thing about the sisters is they they are doing a fine job of protecting their brother's uh, legacy. Right. And um, that's hard work. It's... And when we approached them, it, I had a genuine smile. I was just beaming when I approached them. I was just like, yeah, this is my moment. And before I said anything to them, I just hit them with a big smile. I was just smiling from ear to ear. And then they looked up at me and they smiled back. And I was like, all right, now we can talk. Yeah. Yep. I'm like, this guy, to get a smile out of him? <laughs> I should have said that. You know, I know you do smile, but. Oh, wow. Man, so 
yeah. be a very serious person since I've known since you were like a little little <laughs> you were a little serious person so you were like very serious <laughs> in the first place. and I'm I'm being serious. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, so that was, it's cute. That was a lot of fun. Yep. And then you two had yeah. the or you three had your moment with um uh the Bronx. Oh, you're from New York? I always been I love my New York. I like I'm from there. Like But you know what happened? What? As I'm looking at um how they wrote all right, so I think uh Janine I think she heard me say that my name is Harry and not Larry. Like, it looks like she wrote oh, Harry. And then I'm take a look at that. And then Lee San wrote Larry. I'm like, huh, okay. Now it's <laughs> it's cool. It's cool, but I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, you have to just look at it. But maybe I'm I'm reading too much into it. Maybe she just that's the way she writes her L's. And she'd be like, come right. on. Like, come on. I know what I, I know what I heard. You said Larry. I know what you Yeah. Well, we have to see her like how she writes an L <laughs> on, on, on something else. And then we can um, distinguish. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> see her and say, Hey, could you write this for a second? <laughs> that, that's right. like that's like an episode of Seinfeld. <laughs> right oh man that's the type of stuff that they talk about on seinfeld they're like jerry did you ever notice this what are you talking about Uh, yeah yeah, we have to figure this out Uh, that's the type of stuff that occupied their their minds and stuff on on seinfeld yep yep, yep. right bunch of nothing (laughs) yep exactly So I think they um I think they stopped I think they stopped giving what allowing uh admission on uh on Thursdays for free between five oh, really? Yeah, because I tried to get tickets today. Oh, I thought totally okay. And I was like, hey, the tickets at after five o'clock are not free anymore. <laughs> Like yo, yeah. they like we want we want some more money, man. Like yo, <laughs> right. let me see what happened. I'm I'm gonna try to book something. Yeah, you have to pay. So they right, brought right, right. they brought the price down. They brought the price. Oh no, I screwed up, Randy. So up? yeah. So I should have I should have followed through with the I should have followed through with um with the uh purchase. What do you mean the purchase of of the ticket? Even though the ticket says um even though the okay, okay. So today's Thursday and Thursday's tickets are free after five o'clock. Right. Okay. But mm-hmm. when I checked five o'clock tickets, there was a price next to it. So what you have to do is you have to click on you have to you have to click the time that you want to go, even if there's a even if there's a price there. Okay. Even if there's a price, you have to click on it. And then when you go to choose tickets then it shows as no price it says zero per person oh so you didn't like you said you didn't follow through you just kind of stopped like oh this is the price it had yeah or I, cost involved. I was like why why is there a, a price here like it's supposed to be free and so uh so i missed out tonight i could have been there uh again and um i didn't because i thought i had to pay Mm-hmm. Oh, it's okay. Well, the oh. thing about it is, uh, Imani, Nipsey's mm-hmm. homie, works there, and I would have. And see, I forgot his name when we were there. Right. And 
I could have gone back and taken, um, I guess I could have taken a, a copy of this book. <laughs> he'd be like, he'd probably be like, oh, this brother again, another book. <laughs> Dude, okay, I got the first one. I haven't found time to read it, but I I got it. I got it, bro. <laughs> like, yo. Wait. How This is not your video. Oh, the King Pleasures video just came up. It says, "How are you?" It's just I thought that was one of your videos. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, you you subscribed to it, so now you're getting that y stuff. Yeah. Which is funny how we we're just talking about one of them. So what's cool though is, you know, if if they're if the show ends in LA and if they're not gonna follow up with anything, if they're gonna take a break, you know, and then something different is gonna come up, you know, in the future, then I, I have to say it like Randy, we did it. We we were there for the first uh night, the first day opening. We were there for the uh the hot we were there together for the Halloween party. And we were there for the um, the book signing. So, and you were there in between. Like, oh yeah, different various events, and you went to the New York one. I mean, yeah, like I'm kind of their hometown. their number one their number one fan right now. Mm -hmm. Until you know, some art student comes along and says, "Not so fast, Mister Wiggs." <laughs> <laughs> like oh okay well yeah but um yeah it's been it's been a tremendous uh experience learning about the artwork and then like when i talked with the guy i think his name is patrick and he told me you know he gave me his perspective and he led me down his rabbit hole he's like listen man right because the thing about it is he had worked there and for two months, he was there and he was like day in and day out. He would see these works of art. And he is a fan of Basquiat, mm -hmm. but he said he didn't even see it from that perspective for two months. He had seen the work and he's like, what is Basquiat talking about? And then it, it clicked. One day he looked, he did some research. He looked, you know, more carefully at the work. And then he was like, oh my gosh there it is right there and it it took him two months and when i met him and we were talking he's like all right look over here and there you'll see it and it the image just jumped out at me and i was like "Ooh, that's spooky that's spooky man <laughs> like i you know because i was looking at it saying what the hell was basquiat talking about and it just looks like scribbles right but when you compare it to what he was actually talking about what you know what words he's written there then it's like there it is it's right there in plain sight man yep you're tired yeah i'm tired this is a great conversation my phone is about to die oh yeah my phone just tried my phone okay love you good night love you wait did you are we recording this? Or you stopped it, right? A while ago. No, I'm recording all of this right now. Wait, because I know you had stopped it and then... I just restart. I stopped it and, Stop. and I had... Restart. So it only records like 29 minutes at a time. That's right. Okay. That's right. Got it. Okay. To be continued. Okay. Okay. Good Bye. night. Good night. Bye.